Well, good morning, Sunrise. Welcome to another beautiful spring day. Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Now, if you're watching this, that probably means you couldn't get here on Sunday morning. And isn't that always the way? We can't quite get to God, but praise Jesus, he comes to us. From the very beginning, God Emmanuel means God with us. We couldn't quite get to him, he comes to us. You know, I do want to let you know, if you're watching this online, we miss you. We miss getting to see you face to face. We miss getting to give you a big hug, but we're so glad that we get to stay connected this way. And I hope you are staying connected. I hope you're visiting the website. This week, you're gonna see a special video from Derek Thomas, who's our missionary in Ukraine, uh, really moving. And I hope that you'll take just a few minutes to hear what he has to say about what's happening in Ukraine. You can also give online. So if you go to the give page, you can select general fund from the drop down, and then just type Ukraine in the memo if you'd like to help us contribute uh, to what's going on over there. Praying for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Um, you know, I, I hope that you're doing that every day. I hope that you're just coming alongside of us and lifting them up to the Lord. We also wanna be praying for Art and the loss of his mom. Uh, Virginia last week. And actually, we say the loss of his mom. She's not lost. We know exactly where she is. And it doesn't even matter that she's been healed. It doesn't matter that her mind is now sharper than it's ever been before. What's important is that she's with Jesus right now. And so we want to praise for that. You probably already know about Art's mom if you're on our email list. And if you're not, please send a message to office at sunrisefallbrook.com and we'll add you to that email list. Greg faithfully sends out an update every Sunday morning. Uh, and he normally does the announcements. He's not here right now because he's actually with his dad, uh, who's going through a fairly major surgery today, even right as we uh, record this. So you know what, let's just take a moment and let's pray for Steve, for Greg's dad. Father, we do lift up Steve and just ask that you'll give him uh, a special healing through the midst of this surgery, that you'll give the doctors wisdom. Lord, we ask that you'll give Greg patience and energy as he sits in the hospital just kind of waiting um, Lord, we also pray for Shaley and for Presley, this wonderful masterpiece that you brought to light just over a week ago. Uh, so Greg's running back and forth between two different generations. And so Lord, we just again pray for his energy. I know that uh, Taryn's getting ready to give birth as well. And we pray for her. So thankful for Emerson, Beth Ann's new granddaughter. Lord, there's just so many things around us that bring us so much joy. And we're so grateful for that. Uh, and for my granddaughter, Lizzie who I hear just making noise a little bit here. Uh, Lord, that's a, that's a joyful noise, and we just bless you and thank you for that. We also pray for this upcoming barn raiser, and Lord, just ask that you will have your hands on that, that it'll be a special time, that there'll be a miraculous provision there uh, for the church. Folks, that's the last thing I do want to tell you about this morning is that barn raiser is coming up March 25th. That means this Sunday is the last chance that you have to buy tickets. You can actually buy them at the door and we'll keep selling tickets as long as we have food, but I'm just telling you, I'm already hungry. So you wanna get your tickets ahead of time if at all possible. You know this barn raiser is kinda of stretched out if you will. There's gonna be a lot of different Let's call them episodes. Um, so we're gonna have line dancing at some, some uh, raffles and auctions. We're gonna have to start doing, you know, previously on the barn raiser so that you know what's taking place. But this, this is our pilot episode, the very first one. And so we want you to be involved from the very, very beginning. Uh, folks, we are so excited about an opportunity right now to worship the Lord together, even virtually. And I just pray that you'll do that with us Let's lift up the name of Jesus.
Good morning, church family, and uh, welcome to this Sunday that marks the third week of Lent. And as Ryan told you, we're, we're sending up some special prayers today for Steve Kopik, for Greg's dad, and also be praying for Wilma Chain as well. Wilma, we see you out there and sure do miss you, but uh, we continue to do this so that we can connect and we're so happy to be able to do that. All right, we're continuing our series in the parables and uh, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 13 and starting at verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in a field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servant asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I'll tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
All right, we're going to be looking at this very fascinating parable today. But you know what? Before we go there, I want to start off with a little game of Trivial Pursuit. How many of you are familiar with the famous novel by Stephen King called The Shining, right? I don't know how many of you can tell me when that book was published. It actually was way back in 1977, three years after I graduated from high school. Then it was turned into a feature film in 1980 and directed by the legendary uh, Stanley Kubrick. So let me ask you, how many of you were brave enough to actually read that book or see the movie? And now, how many of you wish you never had, right? Some of us are still haunted by this whole thing to this very day. The Shining is all about a man named John Torrance, or Jack, as his friends call him. He was actually played by Jack Nicholson. But Jack is a struggling writer. He's a recovering alcoholic who accepts a position as the off-season caretaker of the historic Overlook Hotel in the Colorado Rockies. It's a beautiful, secluded hotel, hidden away, way up there in the mountains. But there's only one problem. The place is haunted. Evidently, after living so long in this lonely, isolated setting, the former caretaker went stir-crazy, and he ended up killing his entire family and himself. And now, folks, now their tortured spirits continue to roam the hallways of this massive hotel. Okay, so totally clueless about all of this, Jack agrees to become the new caretaker, and he brings his family with him, including his young son, Danny. Now, Danny, unknown to his parents, possesses psychic clairvoyant abilities known as the Shining, which allows him to perceive the presence of these spirits in the hotel's horrific past. And boom, just like that, one of the most terrifying horror movies ever conceived is born. Okay, so as you can imagine, by the end of the movie, everything explodes into a shocking, violent climax as Jack goes stir-crazy, just like the former caretaker, and he comes after his wife with an axe. And as he breaks through a locked door, he smiles this evil smile, and he says, here's Johnny. You remember that scene? If you saw it, it's one of the most iconic scenes in the history of filmmaking. Okay. Folks, so why in the world am I telling you this scary, creepy story on such a beautiful Sunday morning? I'm so glad you asked. A couple of weeks ago, I was asleep in bed. It was the middle of the night when suddenly I awoke to the sound of my wife talking in her sleep. And do you know what she was saying? It's the gosh honest truth. She was saying, here's Johnny. Folks, I swear that is the truth. That's the honest truth. And then after she said it, she let out this eerie little giggle. <laughs> oh my gosh, it would have been hilarious if it hadn't been so dadgum terrifying. Here's Johnny. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether to wake her up or just go lock myself in the bathroom. Listen, my wife has been known to actually kick me in the backside while she's fast asleep or so she claims that she's sleeping. And that's annoying, but I'll tell you what, I'd take that any day over this. Yeah. Now the next day when I told Terry what happened, she totally denied it. She just didn't believe me for a second. Oh, you were the one who was dreaming. It wasn't me, I never said that. And folks, she still doesn't believe me to this day, but I know what happened. I know, and so does little Danny Torrance. Folks, what is it about the dark side that we find so compelling and fascinating? Well, actually, most of us find this both compelling and repelling at the same time. It's, it's kind of like witnessing a car wreck out on the highway, isn't it? As terrible as it is, for some reason, we just cannot avert our eyes. We can't stop watching it. In the same way, speaking about the theme of The Shining, director Stanley Kubrick said, there's something inherently wrong with the human personality. There's an evil side to it. One of the things that horror stories can do is to show us the archetypes of the unconscious. We can see the dark side, 
without having to confront it directly. You know, when I was a kid, my favorite children's story was the three billy goats gruff. Remember that one? Famous story. It's, it's a Norwegian folk tale, actually, about three goats who are trying to cross over a bridge, bridge to get to the other side and go eat. But in order to do so, they first have to outsmart this mean, hungry troll that lives underneath the bridge. So here's a story. The first billy goat to come by is the youngest and the smallest. Trip, trap, trip, trap went the bridge. Who's that tripping over my bridge, roared the troll. I'm going to gobble you up. Oh no, said the little goat. Please don't take me. I, I'm, I'm too little. Wait, just wait a bit till the second billy goat gruff comes. He's much bigger than me. Well, be off with you then, said the troll. Folks, when I was a kid, I was so obsessed with that evil troll. I just couldn't stop thinking about that mean monster who lived under the bridge and his only job in life was to bully little goats and make their lives miserable. I was fascinated with him. And I couldn't wait until the end of the story when the biggest and oldest billy goat would finally face off with the troll in a grand showdown and get rid of him at last. Trip, trap, trip, trap, trip, trap went the bridge for the billy goat was so heavy that the bridge creaked and groaned underneath him. Who's that tramping over my bridge, roared the troll. It is I, the big billy goat gruff, said the billy goat, who had an ugly hoarse voice of his own. Now I'm coming to gobble you up, roared the troll. Well, come along, said the billy goat. I've got two spears and I'll poke your eyeballs out at your ears. I got besides two curling stones and I'll crush you to bits, body and bones. That was what the big billy goat said. And he flew at the troll. He poked his eyes out with his horns and he crushed him to bits, body and bones and tossed him out into the cascade. And after that, he went on up to the hillside and there the billy goats got so fat they were scarcely able to walk home again. The end. Okay, now that is the original Norwegian version of the story and it kind of sounds like it was written by Clint Eastwood, I get it, but I don't remember it being quite that violent when I was a kid. But either way, at the time I just thought, this is so cool. This is the coolest story I've ever heard. And then I'd pick up the book and read it again, just so I could stare at that big evil troll and just see him, just to see him get trounced one more time. Folks, whether we're having scary dreams at night or watching horror movies in theaters or just witnessing all the evil we see every single day on the evening news, there's a deep desire in all of us to see evil eradicated, right? We want to see it defeated and finally tossed out on its ear. I mean, why is there evil in the world in the first place? And why would an all-powerful God ever allow that? You know, if he's truly all good and all knowing, what's the point? And if he's not going to do anything about it, then what are we supposed to do? In our parable today, Jesus actually addresses some of these issues but as usual, he does it in a way we never would have expected or even desired. Listen again very carefully to this little parable. God's kingdom, Jesus says, is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. That night, while his hired men were all sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. And then he slipped away before dawn. When the first green shoots appeared and the grain began to form, the weeds showed up too. The farmhands went straight to the farmer and they said, Sir, you sowed good seed in your field, didn't you? Then where did these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The farmhands asked, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, the farmer said. While you're pulling the weeds, you might root up the wheat as well. Let them grow together until harvest time. Then I'll instruct the harvesters to pull up the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. You know, later on in this same chapter, Jesus goes on to explain and identify exactly who's who and what's what in this parable. Look at verse 37 here in Matthew 13. Jesus explained, the farmer who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. 
And the good seed stands for the subjects of the kingdom. The weeds are the subjects of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. Okay, now you can't get more straightforward than that, right? This appears to be a pretty simple story that is basically saying, at the end of the age, when Jesus sends out his angels, they will weed out, they'll weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and evil. See, evil or the weeds of the enemy will ultimately be destroyed, but the children of the kingdom, the wheat, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So don't be surprised is what he's saying. Don't overreact to the evil that still exists in the world. God will take care of all of that in his own good time. Now, all of this is absolutely true, of course, but how exactly do we apply it to our own lives here and now while we wait for that great day to finally arrive? So we have to remember one of the big reasons many Jews refused to believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah is because the prophets clearly say when God's kingdom comes, there will be peace on earth. Evil will be eradicated and even nature itself will be restored and reconciled. The wolf will live with the lamb, Isaiah says. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So think about that for a minute. If you think you've got every detail of your end time apocalyptic schedule all figured out, you know, if you've got your late great planet or chart up on your wall and you know for certain that when the Messiah comes there will be world peace, then why does Jesus keep going around saying the kingdom of God is here? It's now. It's already among you. You know, who does this imposter think he is anyway? Everywhere we look, all we see is evil all around us every single day. So kingdom? What kingdom? Folks, the fact is, this was one of the biggest stumbling blocks, particularly for the Jewish people, both then and now. They expected God's kingdom to come all at once, and most likely through the leadership of a godly, earthly warrior, like King David of old. But over and over again, Jesus keeps on teaching how the kingdom of God is paradoxically both already here, but at the same time, it's not yet fully consummated. Already and not yet. And he explains this largely through his parables. See, the Jews were looking for a national uprising against Rome. They were looking for a political revolution that would conquer evil by military, military power and usher in another golden age for the nation of Israel. They could hardly wait. And after all, once again, didn't Isaiah say about the Messiah, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and forever. But here's the rub. According to Jesus, their end time charts were all wrong. Yes, the Messiah will most assuredly reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. And yes, there will indeed be peace on earth one day and the eradication of all evil. But the kingdom does not arrive with a big bang. It arrives among us humbly and slowly and often totally unnoticed by the majority of people. It's hidden, see, and yet present. It's small, and yet it's growing day by day. And only those who have eyes to see and ears to hear will ever perceive it by first perceiving him, the Lord of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, Jesus says, which a man took and planted in his field, though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that all the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. Beautiful. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, or the reign of God, is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. See, Luke tells us that once when the Pharisees asked Jesus directly when the kingdom of God is finally going to come, here's what he said to them. 
The coming of the kingdom is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is, or, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Or more literally, the kingdom of God is in your midst, Jesus says. Folks, what, what, what is Jesus saying here? He's saying whenever and wherever the king truly reigns in our hearts, there you will find his kingdom as well. See, we, today, folks, we desperately want to see our world change for the better, don't we? I do. So what do we do? We, we organize massive campaigns and strategies to elect godly politicians and to legislate morality and to pass laws that are tougher on crime or to manipulate or maintain peace through personal firearms and military strength. But Jesus says such a worldly vision will never usher in his holy kingdom, never. The only way that can ever happen is by God himself changing sinful hearts one at a time, beginning first with me and my own evil heart. See, all too often, folks, all too often we act just like the farmhands in this parable. We spend way too much energy running around trying to ad identify all the weeds out there, both in the church as well as out in the world, why? So, so we can round them all up and toss them out. You know, we weigh their every word and criticize their every action. We dissect their motives and doubt their true intentions. Did you see what those guys are doing now? Did you see that on the news? Did you hear what they said? Ridiculous, shameful. They're evil, I tell you. And we need to take a stand and get rid of them one way or the other as soon as possible for the sake of our nation and our children. We hear that all the time. But folks, last time I checked, weed whacking is not a spiritual gift. It's just not, regardless of how many Christians seem to excel at it. You know, I've heard some interpretations of this parable that goes something like this. They'll say, Jesus clearly teaches us that the devil has secretly planted his minions in every church. So be aware of that and watch out Someday God will prune them out in his own good time, they say. But in the meantime, stay alert. Keep your eyes open. Jesus says they're all around us. In fact, on the outside, they look and sound just like us. But on the inside, they're actually wolves in sheep's clothing. They are weeds masquerading as wheat. Folks, what, what's wrong with this picture? If anything, I mean, isn't that pretty much exactly what Jesus himself says later on in verses 37 through 43? Well, not, not really. See, nowhere in this parable does Jesus explicitly say that the primary problem here are weeds that look like wheat, and we should keep an eye out for them. That's not what he says. That's the first thing we tend to think of. But the real punchline of this story appears to be that apparently we servants and farmhands cannot be trusted to discern between real weeds and simply rough-looking, ragged wheat. I mean, isn't that exactly what we read here? The servants say, Master, you want us to weed out all these nasty thistles? You want us to pull them up and get rid of them? They're really ruining your, your lovely garden. But the farmer says, no, <laughs> no. If, the weed, if you weed the thistles, you might accidentally pull up the good wheat as well. Just let them grow together until the harvest comes. See, Jesus knows that wheat that is still forming can actually look a whole lot like weeds when we're judging it before the final harvest. So we need to watch out, all right. But the reason we need to be careful is so we won't make the mistake of uprooting good wheat in some misguided crusade to clean out all the weeds. That job is best left in God's hands, not ours. Folks, listen, whenever we become more obsessed with the devil than with God, you know, whenever we become more concerned with battling evil than with planting the good news of the gospel, it always leads to angry crusades to purge out the enemy always, rather than applying all our energy to loving our neighbors as ourselves. That's the call. 
See, slowly but surely, our main goal becomes making sure that all those ungodly trolls are kicked out of office or sent away to prison or exposed for who they really are. We relish the thought of it. We literally revel in our hatred for them rather than praying for them and seeking God's best for them. Daniel Emery Price writes, when we hear there are weeds among the wheat, we have a terrible habit of looking for the sinners. The problem is everywhere we look, all we see is sinners. It turns out sinners are all that there are. Sinners on the left and wretches on the right. Our obsession with keeping the church pure and clean, he says, is an outright denial of how very weed-like we all look at times, all of us. We've all had days, months, years, or even decades where we are swiftly cut down by zealous servants on a mission to purge the field. Countless spirits, he says, and schisms in the body of Christ find their roots in this self-righteous and false purity. Every new church tries to figure out a way to be purer than the church before it, a way to have less weeds and more wheat, a church with less substance abuse, porn addiction, adultery, divorce, and every other easily identifiable, grossly unchristian, weed-like behavior. But, he says, what we end up with is a congregation of people lying to themselves, an assembly of the self-deceived. You know, I still remember many years ago when our church went through a very painful split, and I know many of you remember it as well, but I'll never forget how our church quickly divided into two totally separate camps. Those who were in favor of the man who was pastor back then and those who were against him. It's a very, very difficult, challenging time for all of us. But here's the fascinating thing. I'm sure if you would have asked either side at that time, who were the weeds that were masquerading as wheat? You know what? Both sides would have pointed across the aisle and said, it's them, not us. They're the weeds and we're the wheat. In fact, I remember after we ended up losing about 250 people as a result of this schism, some of the folks who remained said, well, good riddance, you know. God has finally purged us and pruned us, and now we can begin again, fresh and new. In other words, thank God he got rid of all those awful weeds. What a mess they were. You know, it wasn't until we started having several all-church prayer meetings of confession and honest repentance that God finally purged us of that sinful spirit of self-righteousness. Folks, whenever any church splits, Everyone involved bears the equal weight of responsibility and accountability, and what a weight it is. God clearly desires unity and peace in his church, not division. And Jesus tells us very specifically what to do when our brother or sister sins against us or when we sin against them. His desire is always and only for forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration of a broken relationship, if at all possible. And when we can't do that, which is all too often the case, it should remind us once again how the church is made up of sinners ever in need of our Savior's mercy. Amen. None of us are pure wheat, not one. No, we are redeemed weeds whom God longs to transform into healthy, growing wheat for the glory of his kingdom. So Jesus says, let the wheat and the weeds both grow together, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, you know, sitting right next to each other in the same pew and mingling together out in the marketplace and in the malls. Yes, a time of divine judgment and harvesting will come. Someday when I return and make all things new, but that's my job, he says. That's my job, not yours. Your job is simply to seek first my kingdom with all your heart, not to spend all your time pulling potential weeds from my garden. Folks, once again, just like last week, we can't help but say, oh my goodness, what kind of crazy farm is this, right? 
I mean, last week we heard Jesus talk about a farmer who instead of carefully cultivating and preparing the soil, he just went around randomly slinging seed everywhere and anywhere, both on good soil and on dry, rocky soil. What? What a waste. You know? Are you kidding me? That's no way to run a successful, productive farm. And now today, see, Today we find out this same farmer is not any better at hoeing than he is at sowing. You know, just let the weeds grow together with the wheat, the farmer says. No problem. We'll worry about that later. And while everyone around him just stares and goes, what? Jesus says, that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Whoever has ears, let them hear. You know, down through the ages, two of the biggest reasons folks give for dropping out of church are, first of all, they say, the church is full of hypocrites. You ever heard that one? Even though they claim to be different, they're no different from anybody else, these Christians. In fact, if anything, there's just as much racism and materialism and arrogance and sexual sin inside the church than there is outside of it. And who knows, maybe even more. And the second reason they give Look, everywhere we look, there is so much evil and suffering in this world. How can anyone possibly believe in a good and loving God? See, the implication here seems to be that if the church would just clean up her act and get it together, then all the wonderful, morally sensitive people of this world would finally say, now that's the church for me. Finally, there's a community who thinks and acts just like me. So good, here I come. Folks, listen, evidently, evidently it's possible to become so caught up in the weeds that we fail to see the bigger picture of what God is up to. And then all we end up doing is standing back and criticizing or trying to tell others how we think they should go about doing their job. See, the servants in this parable are totally preoccupied with the problem of evil. Hey, did, didn't you sow good seeds in this field, right? then where did all these weeds come from? In other words, Jesus, I thought what you created was good, very good. Then how did evil get here? And why is it growing like a bunch of weeds? How can the world have weeds when you're in charge? If you're truly good, then why is the world so bad? But you know what, like it or not, the only answer the farmer gives to the problem of evil, at least in this parable, is simply, an enemy has done this. That's what he says. See, while we insist on sound intellectual answers that will finally satisfy all our doubts, the farmer is apparently concerned with something much different. Namely, whose side are we on in the midst of this conflict? The farmers or the enemies, right? And secondly, whose methods do we propose to use in dealing with this problem. Folks, do you realize that the servants, if they had their way and simply started waging war on all the weeds, if they did that, the devil's work was as good as done. In fact, ironically, they would be doing his work for him without even realizing it, and he could just sit back and watch. But think of this, attacking, accusing, destroying and segregating, you know, stirring up anger, resentment and suspicion. These are all the methods of the devil, not Jesus. See, this is actually a parable about judgment and who gets to judge. When the farmer servants become anxious about all the weeds, they come up with a plan to search out and destroy everything they think is threatening their master's wheat field. But the farmer tells them no. He tells them to relax instead, not to worry. He'll take care of deciding the fate of the wheat in the weeds, and he'll do it in his way and in his own good time. You know, there's an old Peanuts cartoon where Charlie Brown is being confronted once again by his feisty friend Lucy. Charlie Brown, she says, you are the crabgrass and the lawn of life. Folks, it is so easy to look around and believe that all we see is crabgrass and weeds. And especially in this crazy, unpredictable time we find ourselves in, we are quickly convinced that the opinions and values and lifestyles of others are huge impediments 
to the growth of God's kingdom. And it's up to us, therefore, to get this thing cleaned up once and for all before it's too late. And it's a funny thing. The more we act like this, the more we end up looking like those who crucified Jesus rather than those who follow him. We become like the Puritan who turned to his neighbor and said, you know, there is none so righteous as me and thee, and sometimes I worry about thee. Folks, the parable of the sower and the weeds gives us a vision of the world as God sees it, and his perspective is nothing like ours. Jesus is telling us, yes, a time of divine judgment is coming where the wheat will be separated from the chaff, but that is not your concern. In fact, if you can just keep from getting caught up in the weeds of your judgments about other people, constantly critiquing who's in and who's out, then you will finally be free to grasp just how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, not only for you, but for everyone. Christ's message to us today is so simple, and yet it's also more necessary and more essential than ever. See, just like our master, we are to be fruitful sowers and continue to bear fruit, even in spite of what appears to us to be weeds standing in the way of God's kingdom. See, we must never forget the weeds were sown in the field while the farmhands slept. Not the farmer, he's not asleep. In other words, this may catch us by surprise, but not him. God is not surprised or alarmed in the least by all the weeds being planted in his beautiful garden. See, he has a sovereign plan and purpose for them as well. And rest assured, at the proper time, at the harvest, God himself will judge between the wheat and the weeds. But in the meantime, see, in the meantime, our calling as the people of Jesus is to be a lot more faithful in our sowing and a lot less engaged in our judging. After all, by the grace of God, sometimes weeds are transformed into wheat, aren't they? That's the good news of the gospel. So here's our paradox for today. In order to become wheat, we must first come as a weed. As for you, Paul says in Ephesians, you were dead in your transgressions and sins and what you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. In other words, you were weeds. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Thanks be to God. Well, let me close today with an excerpt from Daniel Emery Price's wonderful book. It's all about the parables of Jesus. It's called Scandalous Stories. And this was actually a reflection that, that was in our Friday morning uh, devotional. It's just too good, though, not to hear it one more time. Listen to this. He says, one reason people don't pull up weeds before the harvest is that plants sharing the same soil will have their roots so intertwined that if you uproot one, you may pull up others with it. Could it be that Jesus wants our roots and lives that intimately intertwined? Yes, he says. For now, God wants both wheat and weeds growing up together. He wants us rubbing up against what we'd rather not be close to. He wants us pulling them in, not pushing them out. To be intimately involved in the lives of faithless people to the point where if they were taken from us, it would pull at the very depths of our souls. It would tug at our roots. It's the ever-present opportunity to exercise the freedom to love and extend mercy to people Christ cares for deeply. What may one day be burned up must in the here and now be seen as objects of mercy. And then he says, we cannot clean ourselves up by removing everything dirty from our presence. God doesn't want us that deceived. Here is someone to love, he says. They're not a Christian. They're not very clean. They don't seem to care. Love them. Let your life become intertwined with theirs. Let it cost you something. This is a grace that will not let you stray too far from sinners, lest you start to believe you are no longer one. Amen. Folks, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear.